worldwide, and this toolkit is available through the ACOG website. The first thing, one of the first things you'll do is to identify a physician champion and a nursing leader to help you. They're going to help facilitate the coordination of all the different administrators. They'll help lead the clinical process development and are going to help ensure that the clinical staff receives sufficient training. Most importantly, as you're building allies, you're going to want to identify a lactation consultant leader. You want somebody who's receptive to learning about evidence-based medicine, someone who can be an influencer for you for the other lactation consultants and the nurses on labor and delivery and postpartum. And next, you're going to need to build administrative support and infrastructure. You're going to want to meet with the clinical leadership and management representatives from billing and from pharmacy. You'll meet with them either together or separately. And you're going to need to do some education. These are professionals who are used to thinking about things like contraception in terms of public health, per se. So you're going to want to teach them about the value and the importance of offering women contraception postpartum. You'll also, of course, have to discuss whatever your state funding policies are for Medicaid and for private insurance companies. You're going to need to work with your billing department on how to submit claims for inpatient LARC. There's going to be specified billing codes per the state um, Medicaid and managed care organization policies. There may be levels of customization for claims processes that are required depending on your hospital system. And your hospital is also going to want to identify a mechanism to reconcile reimbursements with patient accounts and to monitor and resolve denials. This can be an expensive venture, and you're going to want to make sure that the billing folks are following up claims to make sure that you're getting paid as you should be. With regards to the pharmacy, you're going to want to make sure that the devices are included in the order systems for hospital pharmacy and then help them determine initial inventory levels based on your anticipated demand. You'll have to help decide with the pharmacy whether or not to stock devices on the hospital floors or in the PIXIS versus the central pharmacy. Pharmacies might like that control over stocking, but of course if the pharmacy has all the devices, then there's potential delays in insertion, and so you'll need to negotiate that. You'll also want to add postpartum LARC to the, either paper billing or to the order set in your electronic health record and make sure that all the appropriate codes are in place before you start. Next, you're going to want to focus on, tra on uh, trading, oh, sorry. One time too many, I apologize. Next is building clinical support for both clinicians and nursing. You're going to want to address everyone's concerns, which may be different for physicians versus midwives versus nurses. Doctors tend to be concerned about the time that it's going to take to place a LARC device. Does it delay them during delivery? Do they have to come back to the hospital later? They'll probably be worried about expulsion rates as well. Midwives would be concerned thinking that they don't do procedures like this often, that midwifery doesn't tend to be as, not that they don't focus on contraception, but the idea of these extra procedures, especially in the delivery room, may not be something that they're comfortable with. And nurses spend much more time with patients and often serve as patient advocates. And since they're involved in explaining medications and side effects in general, you're going to want them to have all the education they need for a postpartum LARC program. And we know, of course, that lactation consultants play a critical role in patient education. And you're going to need to reassure the nurses and the LCs that postpartum LARC, whether it's IUDs or the implant, won't interfere with breastfeeding. The importance of doing this early cannot be understated because you really need to gain consensus from all these different parties and consistency. You want to make sure that what the nurses and the lactation consultants are saying to patients is consistent with what the providers have said to them, both prenatally and around the time of delivery. Then you're going to need to develop counseling consent and insertion procedures. For this, happily, ARHP and ACOG both have a lot of resources that you can use so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then you're going to have to integrate postpartum IUDs and implants into your labor and delivery and postpartum care. There's a lot of considerations around the timing and location of counseling and consent, who's responsible for what with regards to supplies and documentation, um, and issues like this. Then you're going to want to make sure that all clinical staff is trained. And this starts actually with prenatal care providers, which depending on your institution may not be the same providers as on the floor. In my current institution, there are a lot of physicians who are staffing the resident clinic, for instance, with prenatal care patients who don't actually work on labor and delivery. So you're going to want to count, educate them about best practices and patient-centered counseling and about how to document the patient's contraceptive plan. 
you want to make sure that everyone's receiving education about their options. And this is ideally happening during that prenatal, those prenatal visits, probably in the third trimester, and that women's preferences are documented and somehow are transferred to the hospital because the time for counseling around postpartum LARC is ideally not when a woman's actually in labor. Obviously, you're going to want to train all obstetrical providers of all uh, levels of physicians, whether this is OBGYN or family medicine and midwifery, into providing these services. And if you're in a hospital with a residency or fellowship training program, you may want to arrange for training for them separately. With regards to nurses, I've often found it's helpful to do in-services at the time of change of shift meetings or quarterly meetings where you'll get a lot of nurses at once, which makes it easier than repeating the same information multiple times. Um, and then again, just talking about the lactation consultants and whatever is best at your institution for reaching a lot of them at once. So now I want to talk about all the elements of a training program around postpartum IUD. A lot of these previous issues hold true for both IUDs and implants because a lot of the issues around stocking and billing are, um, are the same for both of these devices. But now I want to talk about how do you train providers in postpartum IUD. I think there are four critical elements to a training program for providers, and it starts with protocol writing or borrowing, <laughs> including things like contraindications and counseling practices, training videos, which are now available online, simulation training for practice on a model, and proctored insertion. For clinical guidelines, a lot of these are available through ARHP and ACOG, so you don't have to start with your own SAC, but the kind of things that you're going to include are the indications and contraindications informed consent process, including risks, benefits, and alternatives, what's necessary for provider training, what equipment is needed, and the details of the procedures for both post-placental and cesarean deliveries, and then as well as postpartum insertion before discharge, and then of course documentation and billing. Ideally, your guidelines are going to be clear but comprehensive covering all of these areas. I want to do a sidebar for a few minutes to talk about patient-centered counseling. I think this is important for all aspects of birth control, but it might have particular resonance around postpartum LARC, especially with growing concerns around LARC coercion and around the fact that we may in fact be talking to women about, this, about the placement process while they're in labor or while they're in the hospital. And the ideal time to start all of this is prenatally in order to help women make the best decisions for themselves with all the preferences that they have that need to get away with their options. The ideal time is going to be before they even get to labor and delivery. Christine Dellendorf is a family planning researcher at UCSF and she has a beautiful webinar on patient-centered counseling and so I'm grateful to be able to adapt several of my slides from her work. Patient-centered counseling has been shown to improve outcomes in medical literature across multiple domains and is particularly well-suited for women who, or patients who are making a decision without a right answer, but when preferences may actually be the most important element. And this allows providers to assess patients' preferences about what they really care about with regards to mental changes, return to fertility, and their own personal control of starting and stopping the method gives you a chance to identify misconceptions, and lets you tailor the discussion to what she actually wants and what her need for information is. So there are some important elements of patient-centered counseling around contraception. You need to establish rapport with patients. Obviously, it's really hard to have an in-depth personal conversation with the person that you've just met. Um, but then you're going to want to focus on her preferences and ask what's most important to her about her method. I actually start all of my counseling these days with, what do you want to get out of your birth control? What are the most important things for you? And some patients are able to give you a lovely narrative just from that prompt. Otherwise, I'll talk about things like bleeding, about her stopping and starting, about how long it lasts, about side effects, um, to sort of prompt a discussion about what she particularly cares about about her birth control. Because we know that efficacy is not always the most important thing for patients. And avoiding pregnancy may be the paramount factor for her, in which case it's very easy to start with a discussion of LORC methods, but there very well may be a lot of other method characteristics that come into play. Then you, of course, want to provide context by comparing and contrasting different methods together, things that she may have heard about one method of contraception that may actually be a factor in other methods, too. You want to describe effectiveness and side effects in ways that are easy to understand. Sometimes it's just relative, more common, less common, as opposed to a lot of numbers. And you want to offer to provide information on all methods if women are interested so she can make a decision based on full information. 
there's some evidence that even if women come in wanting a LARC device or wanting the pill or wanting to put Provera, they actually want to be offered information on other methods. That way they can feel like they're making a full decision. And then you can tailor the information that you give by considering her preferences and what's really important to her. I tend to use the bedside or pads of the tear-off pages that show the methods tiered by efficacy because it gives me a visual aid as I can go through the methods one by one and talking about what might be good for her, more good or less good based on what her preferences are. I think the most challenging part of counseling can be myth-busting, that you want to address people's misconceptions. It's part of your job as a provider, right, is to give information that's accurate and to be that counter voice against Dr. Google and her friends who tell her things that aren't correct. But you want to be respectful at validating her experiences. If she says that the copper IUD made her gain weight, you're not going to really gain anything by a long conversation about how it really didn't make her gain weight. Um, and so you want to just provide information in the most respectful way you can. And you want to give her a structure her for her decision making. You know, given her preferences, what information does she need more than what you're telling to make her decision? And so this is how you can sort of actively facilitate her process while trying to keep your opinions out of the process unless she asks for it. There's some evidence that some patients will want our opinion, but in general, only if they ask and not based on anecdote. So I know there's a trend, myself included in this, towards self-disclosing with patients if you're using a LARC or what your other patients have experienced, but a lot of patients don't actually want that anecdote. They want it to be based on more than that. And then most importantly, in discussing the process of insertion, you also want to discuss removal, that idea that women can have devices removed at any time, no questions asked, even if it's before the device um, has expired. So in this context, patient-centered counseling for postpartum IUD should include a long talk about the risks and the benefits. And when you start talking about something like the higher expulsion rate, see with postpartum IUD, it's important to put that risk in context, that expulsion of an IUD won't cause damage to her body, and that she can have another device placed at her convenience if she wishes. I would discuss the common need to trim the strings postpartum as they can get quite long, and that missing strings are more common, particularly with C-section placement. And of course, discussion of the routine IUD risks like bleeding infection, malposition, and perforation. When it comes to benefits, obviously the timing is incredibly convenient. I would also argue that there's less discomfort that for patients who are afraid of getting an IUD in the office, that in the delivery room might be the ideal time to have an IUD placed. There's no need for a return visit for insertion. And you can do the string check at her postpartum visit. And very clear verification that she is not pregnant. As for most of us, we will quick start all birth control methods except an IUD. So everyone in the room is reassured that she's not pregnant. And most, parts, most of them will have insurance coverage for contraception through the postpartum period. It's also important, though, to mention as a risk the disappointment at not receiving the device. And I think that this may be sort of considered silly at first, but in my experiences, when a woman is really looking forward to getting an IUD and then she has a hemorrhage or has an infection afterwards and we choose to not place it because of safety concerns, patients have been outraged and devastated. And so I think it's really worth bringing up that patients may not receive the device even if they want it and even if it's available. For immediate postpartum process, there are a couple of contraindications, so a current or untreated STI that's detected in the third trimester, cor frank chorioamnionitis prolonged rupture of membranes is a relative contraindication, as is unresolved postpartum hemorrhage. And then the routine contraindications around uterine anomaly and fibroids, tumors, severe anemia, breast cancer, and pelvic TB. Two things I think it's important to mention that are not contraindications to immediate placement of an IUD are delayed infection and delayed hemorrhage. So fever or signs of choreo after placement just like with a patient with regular PID, should be treated with routine antibiotics if they're indicated. And you should only remove the IUD if she doesn't show improvement after 48 hours of treatment. So for the patients who spike a temp the next day, you think, oh no, she has an IUD in place, it is okay, you can start your antibiotics, and as long as she gets better, the IUD can stay in. Same with hemorrhage. Quite a few patients, it feels like in my experience, will have a little extra bleeding at delivery. But as long as that delivery bleeding is controlled and you put the IUD in, there's no reason to worry. But of course, if she bleeds later after the IUD has been placed, you can 
start your initial treatment the same way that you would without the IUD with deuterotonics as indicated or fully placement. If you think you're going to have to go back in the uterus for a DNC or a Bachmi balloon placement, you may have to remove the IUD then. But if it's one of these situations of acne with a slow trickle where you don't think you're going to do a balloon and for whatever reason you're going to embolize her, you actually can leave the IUD in place during embolization. The equipment available for a post-placental IUD tends to be things that you have on your delivery cart already. You'll need a speculum of some sort. Um, a Graves is very comfortable, but if you have a Sims retractor or a right angle retractor, that should be sufficient. You'll want some kind of cleansing solution and cotton balls, scopette, swabs, or sponges. You'll want to have ring forceps available, possibly for placement and possibly to act as a tenaculum on the cervix, although we'll talk about that in detail. You'll want scissors for the strings, and we'll talk about detail as well, possibly ultrasound. I always tell the residents when they're gathering equipment together, speculums, scopettes, scissors, and sono, and then we're set. As for training videos, there are now three videos available online, which is lovely that we don't have to pass around a DVD of videos anymore. Um, in the picture is Dr. Paul Blumenthal at Stanford, who has a wonderful video about postpartum IUD placement. This is the first video that was available online, and now there are two other ones as well, and so the links will be available through this PDF, through this webinar. There are two kinds of simulation training that are going to be the easiest for most people to gather. The first is that Laredal Health has a postpartum IUD model that was actually developed for global health and for international use, but is available in the US. It costs $210, and it is a wonderful model that lets you put a speculum in place, place the IUD, and then you can lift up the flap to see what your placement was like. It also lets you use your other hand, as in the picture on the right, to push the uterus down to have to practice different angles of placing the IUD from a almost straight track to one that's much more acute. So this is the Mama U model. Then there's what I call the Amazon U model. This is much easier to acquire. There are only two components. They total less than $20. They're available on Amazon. The first is a built New York wine ba bag that fits two bottles of wine, and the other is a camping stuff sack, the kind that you would put your jacket in to serve as a pillow. Um, you'll get the kind of sack that is usually nylon on the outside, but fleece lined on the inside. And the first step to building this model is to remove the center seam from the wine tote. If you have a seam ripper in your house, or scissors will do just fine. Then to place this stuff sack into the wine bag, and then you can cinch it closed, which lets you change the sort of dilation of your cervix, if you will. And it's amazing how well this fleecy interior in this bag does replicate the feel of a postpartum uterus. For maximum results, you can place the bag inside a pelvic model, if you're in a teaching institution, with a couple of folded up blue towels under the, the fundus, so to speak, to represent the usual uterine configuration after delivery. But the wine bag can also just be held um, by a person who's letting that someone train with them, um, and then they can hold the bag at the appropriate angle. And then proctored insertions. Um, it's sort of a C1, D1, teach one situation. And sometimes providers are really hesitant at placing IUDs right after the placenta comes out. And I buoy them by saying that the skills are really similar to other skills you're using in gynecology. Everyone places IUDs in the office. A lot of providers are doing hysteroscopy. You're just having slightly different considerations with this device at this time. Ideally, you'd like to have someone experienced proctor you before your first placement, but honestly, someone at your institution may need to be the first. It can be really difficult to, because of hospital privileges, have an actual trained person in a delivery room with you to teach you. So someone may be the first person to start this off and then can establish the training of others. When I started my first postpartum IUD program, we trained a core of providers, which were actually going to be the second year residents, because they were the ones who had, first of all, had enough office experience, but then were most available on labor and delivery to go around to place IUDs for patients who wanted them. And with the second year residents then getting trained, they then trained other people. And the residents, I will be honest, really loved training faculty <laughs> in any kind of skill. Um, and so after someone is trained and sort of signed off, then they could train other people. And in our preliminary study, which we did through a research protocol, we had a 5% expulsion rate with doing this. So even with learners who are younger than other experienced providers, once they learn it, once they can do it well, 
he decides for them to teach other people. We have found that on average people need three to five insertions before they feel really comfortable, and that number really varies based on how difficult the insertions are. Um, some insertions are really easy and that others are really challenging. So after two challenging insertions, you're pretty much ready to go. Then once all the different elements of your privileging program have been met at your institution, you can sign a provider off. And there's going to be different protocols in different departments. My previous chair had asked for written verification that providers had completed all the elements of training, so I created this sheet, um, which basically signed off providers. Each provider attested that they had read the guidelines, that they watched the videos, that I confirmed that they practiced on the model. I had brought the model to Grand Rounds when I talked about postpartum IUD, and that I had it on labor and delivery with me when I was on call to let people have access to it. Um, and then since they weren't always proctored by me, they were signed off by the proctoring provider. Um, and then we this is part of their periodic credentialing. It was kept on file. And then we included it with the credentialing of new providers to the hospital as well. So now I want to talk about the details of sort of actually how you insert the IUD. There's three different ways to insert it and three different time periods. And in, for full disclosure, there's no evidence basis at this point for choosing one method of insertion over another. So I'm going to give you the be benefits of my experience and that of my colleagues, but you can consider that accordingly. So with regards to the IUD, there are three ways to insert it. You could use the inserter that the IUD comes with. You could use a ring forceps or you can manually insert it. My favorite is using the IUD inserter itself. It's what most providers have the most experience with. You can then use a consistent technique for both immediate post-placental and later in the postpartum uh, time period when manual insertion isn't really possible. Um, and so my tricks with this is that you're going to move the little blue ring or whatever uh, slider there is on this device back to the handle and then you'll bend the inserter tube at the handle. You'll see with, the, with this model here that you can bend it really severely, and you can actually sort of bend it in two places, once at the base of the inserter tube right by the handle, and once a little further up. And I found that those bends of the tube really help facilitate placement of the IUD up to the fundus. So once you bet your inserter tube, you'll move the inserter past the bend to the lower uterine segment. Then once that you know that you're past the bend, you can open the arms, and then you can place the IUD at the fundus. For using ring forceps, um, this advantage is that it works for all IUDs because the copper IUD and the older Laletta inserters are not well suited for postpartum insertion because they're just simply too short. Um, you can grasp the IUD with the ring forceps. You don't want to close the ratchet. So you don't want to risk crushing the IUD, so you just want to hold it firmly without the ratchet and then you're going to insert the forceps through the cervix up to the fundus. Now you'll see in this picture the ring forceps with this curve are sort of off to the side, so you're holding the, the rings of the forceps are holding the, both the crossbar and the stem of the IUD. You have the most stability holding it this way, although it means that you may be inserting the forceps at a funny angle. If you need that curve of the forceps to help get around the lower uterine segment, I think it's okay to turn your hand so that you're using the instrument to follow the curve of the uterus, you'll just want to then turn it back 90 degrees so you've placed the arms in the usual configuration. Then once you're at the fundus and you open the forceps to release the IUD, you really slowly remove the forceps, keeping them slightly open and hoping that you don't catch the IUD or the strings on the way out. Then the last way is the manual insertion method. With this method, you're going, it doesn't require an ultrasound, but you sometimes can't be sure that you're at the fundus. It may be difficult without an epidural, and I would argue that it's really not possible if it's not immediately placed after, after the placenta. This is a really hard technique on postpartum day one or two. So you'll grasp the IUD between your second and third fingers. You'll insert your hand in the fundus, and you'll use your other hand to palpate the fundus abdominally to confirm that you have gotten up that far. Then you'll slowly open your fingers and remove them from the uterus. So in some ways, this is the simplest method requiring the least amount of equipment, but I think it might be hard to verify that you've actually gotten the IUD where you want it. Then after you've inserted it vaginally, you'll cut the strings of the IUD flush with the external os. You want the strings to protrude a little bit to reduce the risk that they're going to retract into the uterus, but you want to make them as short as possible because we know that the strings are going to get longer as the uterus involutes. Um, then you'll remove the speculum, and you can repair any remaining lacerations. 
I tend to leave small or not bleeding lacerations to be repaired after IUD insertion because I want to get that IUD in place as quickly as possible after the placenta delivers. Obviously, a bleeding second degree laceration you're going to want to repair, but small ones, whether they're labial or vaginal, can usually be left until the IUD is in place. I can't stress enough the importance of fundal placement of the IUD. It's my suspicion and that of a lot of my colleagues that the reason for the high expulsion rate that can be sometimes very high seen in studies is because the IUDs are actually just not making it to the fundus. There's a very acute bend of the uterus postpartum, and you can see it with the hand of the picture on the left or with at the, the angle of the illustration on the right, that it can be very hard to get around that bend. So I think ultrasound guidance is the best way to confirm that you get there. I've seen a lot of cases where people think that they're there, and then when they put the ultrasound on, they're still actually much lower than they want to be. Um, and with obese patients in particular, you really may need ultrasound guidance because the hand on the abdomen won't be enough to confirm that you're actually at the fundus. I talk about the shape of the uterus as being like a hockey stick, that it can be that acute at the, at the base. So the cesarean delivery, obviously things are a little bit different. So you'll perform your routine external massage of the uterus and your internal sweep with a sponge to get whatever trailing membranes are left. And then if you have an older inserter of the IUD that the strings are exposed as opposed to hidden inside, you'll want to cut the strings of the IUD at the end of the handle. Then through the hysterotomy incision, you'll place the IUD at the fundus. And then you'll have the assistant hold the IUD in place while you remove the inserter and then try to tuck the strings down through the cervix. It's a little bit controversial as to whether or not you want to try to tuck the strings into the vagina. I hold that if the cervix was dilated at all, and if you think a ring forceps can easily move the strings down through the cervix, it's worth the very slight risk of infection to have the strings through the os, making removal easier later. Um, but if the cervix was long, thick, and closed, and this is a scheduled repeat section, that might not be possible. Then you want to close the hysterotomy, being really careful to not incorporate the strings into the closure. So in some cases, we've used a flat, malleable retractor to hold the strings down and out of the way while the first person closes their half of the hysterotomy. And then at that point, the strings tend to be low enough that you can close the other side without a problem. So if you're not able to get an IUD in in those first 10 minutes after vaginal delivery or C-section, you can still place it while a patient is postpartum in the hospital. All the other rules apply about it being convenient timing, um, and the cervix is dilated, and so placement is somewhat easier. Um, and so in addition to the other equipment that you'll need for vaginal insertion, you'll also need a bed that breaks away and a light source. Sometimes this is the most challenging part of a postpartum insertion is because a patient who's been moved from labor and delivery to postpartum no longer has the equipment in the room. And sometimes it's actually easier to take her to another bed in another location to place the IUD. Um, this is not something I would recommend doing on a bedpan. You can offer patients premedication with ibuprofen or some other um, analgesic. There's no evidence that this helps, just like with, post, uh, with regular insertion. You'll want her to empty her bladder ahead of time. And I think a Graves speculum is more comfortable in the postpartum period um, than a right angle retractor or a SIMS would be. And I think in, in these cases, you may need a ring forceps more common to act as a tenaculum. So some tips and tricks for insertion. I tend to change my gloves after delivery, when I'm in the delivery room, not during a C-section, but with a vaginal delivery, um, because I think it's cleaner, a little easier to grasp the instruments. And it's smart if you're going to use an ultrasound for placement to get the ultrasound in the room prior to delivery. Um, if your hospitals are like mine, there's a lot of folks that after delivery, especially if you needed to come in and trying to fit the ultrasound into the room at that point is quite challenging. So we tend to <coughs> excuse me, ask someone to get it ahead of time. I would also confirm good uterine tone and complete your examination of the placenta before you open the IUD package. It is painful to everyone involved to start opening the IUD package and then all of a sudden realize you either have to go to the OR for a DNC, she's bleeding too much and you can't control it in the next couple of minutes and you don't want to place the IUD and you've already opened the IUD package. I have found that having a tenaculum on the cervix, especially for immediate postpartum placement, is usually not necessary. It doesn't usually help move the uterus like it would with an interval insertion. Um, 
it can help stabilize the cervix, but if something is particularly difficult, that's the first step I would do is to put a ring force up on the anterior lip or the posterior one if that's the angle that you're, that you're fighting. But in general, you should be able to try to place the IUD without it. And then if you're having difficulty traversing this hockey stick angle of the lower uterine segment, what you can do is you can, with your left hand, if you're a righty, is you can lower the speculum or the retractor to allow dropping of your inserter hand even further. And I've tried to demonstrate this with this little sort of graphic that you want to go down as much as possible before you then curve up with your right hand. And you can be amazed by how much with your left hand you need to pull down in order to make enough room for your right hand to go down and then up around that curve. So I hope that this has been helpful at maybe um, at illuminating some of the challenges of starting a postpartum LARC program in your institution. Once you do your first one, you realize just how easy the whole process, or really how worth it the process was, and how easy the insertion process is. And it's amazing how fast you'll win allies. We had nurses who were very against this process on labor and delivery. They just thought it was completely unnecessary and going to be a huge burden. And within, within a few weeks, really, of starting with lots of good outcomes, we would have nurses pulling us aside saying, yeah, the patient room seven, if you counseled her about an IUD, they should be great for an IUD. And so you can get a lot of allies on your side very quickly. So I'd say thank you very much for listening. And I would love to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. White, for that excellent presentation. I will now start reading questions for you to answer. And we're just waiting for them to come in. This is just a reminder to enter in your questions now if you've been taking notes during the presentation. During the first part of our series, we talked about a lot of the data around um, insertion of postpartum LARC and sort of making the case for it. But if anyone missed that webinar and has questions about the material that would sort of um, proceed the information I talked about today. I'm certainly happy to talk about that as well. All right, our first question comes from Susan, who asks, although the meta analysis Leave an adjust role. Um, I'm sorry, you're you're breaking up. I can't hear the question. I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me better now? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So Susan asks, although meta-analyses and randomly controlled trials show no difference in breastfeeding, can you comment on Chen's article showing decreased breastfeeding at six months with leave an adjust role IUD, IUDs? I would have to, to dive back into Beatrice Chen's article to look. I know that study wasn't designed to look at breastfeeding, and so I don't know about the other factors that were in that study that might have led to differences in breastfeeding between groups. I know that the studies that are coming out that were designed to look at breastfeeding um, are showing no difference. There was actually some data presented at the Forum on Family Planning in Denver last week of of a large randomized trial looking at both lactogenesis and at other factors about exclusive feeding and any feeding at six months, they didn't see a difference. So I feel like at this point the preponderance of the evidence we have, even though it's weaker than we might like, is showing no difference. And I would also take comfort from the CDC medical eligibility criteria which places the implant in the same category as Depo-Provera and Micronor, meaning they're both considered a two in the immediate postpartum period because there's just not enough evidence to say that any of them are really at risk for breastfeeding moms. So if you would consider giving her Depo or Micronor, the data for the implant is 
as good or better with regards to impact on breastfeeding. Great, thank you. I know in the first webinar in the Q&A session, we also talked about uh, the differences or lack thereof between immediate postpartum insertion of LARCs um, after giving birth full term versus after a spontaneous or an elective um, miscarriage um, in either the first or second trimester. Um, would you like to talk briefly or um, recap briefly the differences and similarities and just um, maybe some additional considerations for those specific cases? Sure. I think a lot of the information is very similar, particularly around counseling and wanting to do that in a really non-directive, patient-centered kind of way. I think abortion patients may be the most vulnerable to coercion for contraception around that time. Um, after a first trimester of miscarriage or abortion, the insertion feels very similar to an interval insertion. Um, the dilation, of course, is much nicer, um, but the uterine size tends to be about the same. Um, and comfort, of course, of the patient is usually improved because they have some of, some of their medication on board. But with regards to things like angle of insertion, for second trimester procedures, it is still, I would say, easier than a postpartum IUD insertion. Um, that acute angle of the lower uterine segment is not nearly as acute. Um, I still do second trimester insertions under ultrasound um, if I'm with a learner. If I'm with myself, I feel like at this point I know if I've gotten to fundus or not um, because you'll feel it very clearly with a second trimester uterus. But with learners, I will still use the ultrasound because it can be so difficult to traverse that lower segment. Great. Thank you. We're just waiting for an additional question to come in. And this is just a reminder to folks to use the Q&A or chat box to enter in your questions. If anybody anticipates particular problems at their institution, even if you think that you might be the only one, I'd be happy to, uh, to sort of problem solve with you, either on the phone or offline. That's a great point. I remember in the first webinar we um, more just commiserated on the challenges with Catholic hospitals since there's nothing we can really do. But um, we'd love to have a more in-depth discussion on this webinar if folks have questions on that. Um, yeah, Mickey asked, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, Mickey asks, can you describe how you educate or provide counseling to avoid coercion? Sure. I think when I lead with what's important to you and really make a point of, in my notes, sort of documenting the points that a woman brings up about whether it's, it tends to be a lot of bleeding concerns or concerns about her ability to control stopping and starting a method um, and where efficacy lies for her on that spectrum, um, if I lead with that and then I go through all of the different methods and I say, okay, here's how this method fits in with what you talked about. So for instance, if, if you don't want to tolerate a lot of spotting, then some levodigestral IUDs may be better than others. The copper IUD might be great because the spotting tends to be very short-lived. And the implant may be a very bit of a flip of a coin of it may be great and it may be horrible, and then I stress that um, one of my lines is that you are dating your birth control method. You don't marry it, <laughs> so there's no commitment to keeping it if it doesn't work for you. So I very often will stress that whatever you want to try, I would give it three months to let your body sort of equilibrate with whatever the hormonal effects are going to be for you. But if it's not working by then, you don't need to keep suffering. We will absolutely take it out and try something else. And so because I think that I don't leave with this is what I think you should do, I'm hoping that I'm coming across in a non-directive way. Because in the end, it's her decision about how important avoiding pregnancy is. And for patients who, in the end, it might not be really that important to avoid pregnancy, the birth control pill or the patch might be perfect for her. But another person who says they would be 
devastated by an unintended pregnancy, then I say how I'm hearing that efficacy of the method might be the most important thing for you. And if she agrees, then it really opens the door to talking about the LARC methods first. That's such a great point. Um, on a related note, do you have any tips or tricks for fellow providers to educate them on appropriate informed consent practices? Well, you know, there's, you want to include this in the guidelines, but we all know that even if people sign off that they've read them, you don't know how well they've absorbed them. I would argue that if you're going to bring this to your institution, that a grand rounds or any kind of other sort of public forum for education, whatever it would work in your institution, is really kind of vital. And you can get national speakers from the Family Planning Fellowship and the Ryan programs and possibly from ACOG. You direct people to webinars, of course, but having a person talking about the data behind it so that they have all their questions answered about what the risks and the benefits really are, um, and including a conversation around patient-centered counseling, I think is really key. I think as our field is sort of shifting from this fully tiered base, all about efficacy, inevitably almost all about LARC kind of counseling towards trying to be more open, it's requiring a lot of conversations with a lot of providers where this goes really against the way that they were either taught or have done it for years. And so I think it's a challenge not just around postpartum placement, but around contraception in general. That's such a great point. Thank you so much. Our next question asks, do you have any tricks for getting um, IUDs that have been exposed paid for, or any other tips or tricks for overcoming financial barriers? Sure. I know that each of the, of the pharma companies has a, they have a, a guide for how many days after insertion they will reimburse an expelled IUD. And I want to say it's 60 days, but I don't know. And this is even for postpartum insertion. We haven't had a problem getting it reimbursed within whatever stated period they reimburse for expelled devices. After that, though, I have not had any luck with like the, you know, the drug company giving me another device. Um, I have, though, to be honest, not encountered a lot of problems with patients' insurance companies, even Medicaid, with placing another device in the few months postpartum when it's been expelled. Um, clinically, I don't think a lot of the insurance companies that I have had to de deal with have that level of granularity when looking at these claims on <laughs> contraception. And that may be different in other states, I, I freely admit. Um, but so I would say if it expels very quickly, like in the first six weeks, you may be able to get another device just from, um, from there or from, uh, from the companies that create, make the IUDs. With regards to reimbursement in general, um, we talked about this a bit on the first webinar. If your state is not one of the states that Medicaid covers postpartum LARC, you may want to use other means of procuring devices. And that for patients with commercial insurance, they can often get the device directly through their insurance company. I know that's what my friends who have practices in New York City do because the reimbursement in New York for IUDs doesn't cover the actual cost of the device, that patients just in the office for interval placement have to bring the device with them for placement. And so they, the office you know, helps them with the phone number to call for their insurance company and they work it out with their private insurer to get the device mailed to them at their home or mailed to the office for placement. For patients on Medicaid, um, in Massachusetts and in other states, although I don't know about all 50 states' policies, Medicaid will often cover the IUD as a prescription benefit, which then lends itself to intriguing possibilities. At my old institution, we, what we call brown bagged the IUDs, where the hospital pharmacy, outpatient pharmacy, stocked the IUDs. We would write prescriptions to patients in the third trimester. They would fill the script, get the IUD, bring it home, put it in their baby bag, and then bring it into the hospital when they were in labor. That process is informally called brown bagging. Other hospitals don't allow that because they don't want the devices to leave the hospital to unknown you know, temperature and, and you know, sterility conditions. So they do white bagging, which is where you write the prescription, the pharmacy staff fills the script, and then a pharmacy technician brings the device to the labor floor for the patient. 
So some hospitals will do this, others will allow brown bagging, and it's probably worth chatting with your pharmacy and your hospital administration about if you're in one of those states where you need to have a creative workaround for coverage of the device. Great, thank you so much. So we have run out of time for questions. Would you like to take us through the key points, Dr. White? Sure, I would say that develop, having a lot of allies on your side as you start this process will prevent problems later. So inevitably, I apologize, it means a lot of meetings and a lot of emails with a lot of key, uh, key players, but I think that the implementation will go smoother if you can get multiple people on your side at the start um, and problem solve before you try to implement. I would say use the resources that are available to you already without having to create these from scratch. Um, and I, as one of many people, I'm always happy to share all the things that I have developed. Um, and I know that ARHP is greatly improving its uh, store of LARC um, resources on the website in the coming year, so you can look forward to that. Um, and that with the insertion process, I would not just let everybody start doing it at once. I would have a couple, a core group of people trained who can problem solve together and work together to figure it out for your institution, and as, as they get comfortable, then you can have them train other people. Um, you know, my experience, that leads to a more successful implementation of this program um, that a lot of people who may not have all the training they need just start doing it. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful summary. Um, and thank you again for joining us, Dr. White, and thanks to all of you for taking time out of um, whatever healing process you're hopefully engaging in to join us for today's webinar. Before we conclude today, I just have a couple of additional reminders. In about an hour, you will receive an email from Caitlin Borsowitz containing a link to the post-test survey. Your CME or nursing CE certificate will be generated at the end of that survey. Be sure to print the certificate before closing your internet browser. If you have questions, just feel free to email us at education at arhp.org. A recording of today's webinar will be posted shortly on arhp.org which is also where you can find recordings of the previous webinars in this series regarding difficult IUD insertions, as well as the benefits of immediate postpartum work. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope you will take part in other live and on-demand sessions hosted by ARHP.